we're going to t we're going to change direction. Uh, we get, uh, we've been talking about human migration all morning, and just before lunch, we're going to just spend 10 minutes thinking about migration of animals instead. And to lead us through that, I'm very pleased to welcome Suzanne Urkerson, who is a uh, professor of animal ecology at Lund University. So if we all depart, Suzanne will take over. Thank you. I'm very grateful to be here to talk about animal migrants regularly performing migration across the globe. Every year, hundreds and thousands of Laotian albatross chicks are born at Midway Atoll in the Hawaiian archipelago. They are fed by their parents for 165 days, approximately. The parents forage on squid, they catch in sea, at sea, primarily at night. After those days, they are ready to leave the island, but they have to leave alone because the parents have already left. They will spend the, re the, the next seven to nine years wandering around the North Pacific. And after that time, they will return to the island and breed themselves. If they're lucky, they will continue to breed with the same partner for 40 years. But how do they find the way during the first migration? We've studied the first migration by wandering albatrosses at the Crossay Islands in the South Indian Ocean. We tracked the movements of the juveniles and adult birds. And the juvenile wandering albatrosses, they have inherited a capacity to find sex-segregated wintering zones or foraging zones at sea that overlap with the adults. But we know, because they depart later than the parents, that they have found these areas by themselves. At Ascension Island in the South Atlantic Ocean, Charles Darwin visited this island on the travel with the Beagle and noted that there's massive numbers of adult green turtles on the beaches, and he speculated about where they came from. We know that from December to June, Ascension Island and the few beaches there are, are visited by many green turtles for egg laying. The Around four and a half thousand females go there each year and lay their eggs. And in total, they lay 24,000 clutches of eggs. It means that nearly three million hatchlings are leaving this island on the first migration. We also know they migrate alone. We know that they have inherited a program encoded in their genes that will enable them to react to gravity, visual information, wave patterns, and the geomagnetic field to guide them to open sea. We've been able to track the migration of the adults, and we know that they will travel to Brazilian coastal waters after breeding, and it takes them four years to refuel after this long migration and reproduction to put on fat to, to be able to return. We will also track the homing behavior of those female turtles during breeding. And we've discovered that the successful routes correlate with the downwind direction from the island. Likely they are reacting to uh, some information that's transported by the winds, possibly odors, to locate the island again. The boar-tailed godwit is a wader breeding in high arctic tundra, and they perform migrations from Alaska to New Zealand. It's a spectacular long migration. They perform it non-stop for six to nine days, it will take them 10,000 kilometers. 
without landing. To prepare for this long migration, they need to refuel for 60 days or more in Alaska. And they will more than double the mass during that time. But just before departure, they will shrink the intestines, the liver, the kidney, and the, and the stomach to save energy. But how do they find the way? From work with songbirds, we know that birds have compasses that ba are based on information from the sun, the stars, and the geomagnetic field. We also know that they have map uh, information from odors, landmarks, and geomagnetic information that can guide them. The common swift is an insectivorous bird. It catches insects on the wing. It places uh, its eggs in nest boxes or tree holes or maybe in cliffs or cavities in houses. One to three eggs. At the ecology building where I work, we have 144 swift nest boxes under the roof. We have nest box cameras to monitor the breeding but we can also capture the swifts and tag them and track the migrations. We've used miniature data loggers recording time and light to track the migration of swifts. But we've also captured swifts in other locations like here in northern Swedish Lapland in natural nest box colonies. We've found that when the swifts migrate south and they are crossing the Mediterranean Sea and the Sahara, it takes them roughly a month in autumn, but only five to six days in spring, hitchhiking with tailwinds. We continue to track swift from the other locations in Europe. Eleven populations from northern Sweden to southern Spain. And we've discovered an unusual uh, chain migration pattern in the common swift, meaning the northern swifts will winter furthest to the north. The southern swifts, uh, will continue to migrate through Africa to southeastern parts and enjoy uh, the seasonal rains providing insects in midwinter. We've also been traveling to other places and track the subspecies of the common species, the uh, common swift, the pekinensis, here in Beijing in the eastern part of the range. By mist nets, we have captured the swifts leaving the colony under the roof of the summer palais in one morning. We have ringed all the birds by local ringers and then tagged some of them with the loggers. The next year they are captured again and we know where they have been. We found that these swifts they migrate to southwestern Africa and back. It means 30,000 kilometers in one year, an enormous distance. And they will arrive later than the swifts from Europe and explore more dry areas in southern Africa. We've also produced our own multi-sensor loggers measuring acceleration, light and time. And thereby we've been able to measure the flight activity of swifts. And the actograms here in this graph shows the red lines that the swift have been landing two times in the winter. The black bars show that they will spend the night at, in summer in the nest boxes. And the white bars show that they are continuously flying. And this bird has been landing only twice the first year and none the second year. It means that 99% of the time in winter or non-breeding, the swifts will fly. The swifts can fly up to 10 months without landing. So swift life means that it will cover seven turns around the globe in one year and seven turns to the moon and back in a lifetime. A related species to swifts are the European nightjar. It also forages on the insects, but it catches it on the wing at dusk and dawn, use, using, using the vision to find the prey. And we've discovered by using the multisensor loggers that they perform the migration to 
southern Africa, and they make stopovers in various places and up to a month in the Zael zone on spring migration before they cross the Sahara. Our loggings through the year have shown the flight activity is strongly correlated with the moon cycle. It means for the night jars foraging at dusk and dawn that they can expand the foraging into the night when the moon is there for them. And that means that they can fuel faster on migration. And we've seen from the logging that, in fact, the peak migration occur around 11 days after full moon. And then it means that thousands of night jars are flying at the same time in Europe and Africa on the way to the wintering ranges. It's not only birds that migrate. We also have animals migrating within continents, like the wildebeest migration in eastern Africa. They are moving in large herds involving 1.5 million wildebeest. They have to cross rivers. It's a high risk of the migration, and they may meet Nile crocodiles at those crossings. This migration is a clockwise loop through Kenya and Tanzania and enable animals to leave dry land and enjoy the seasonal rains and the grass that's newly grown, where the calves are born and they can feed the young. But the huge amount of biomass transported by those migrations will also be explored by local carnivores. It's not only big animals migrating. Here's another example. The painted lady is a butterfly migrating from tropical Africa to northern Europe and back in one year. But it's not just one generation. This migration system consists of six generations of butterflies, each covering part of that route from where they are born to where they will reproduce. And some years they are migrating in high numbers. As the painted ladies migrate south in the summer in eastern Sweden, the Caspian turned chicks are still fed by their parents, preparing for the long migration south of the Sahara. We've been able to track families of Caspian terns, and in nine out of ten cases, it's a father or a foster father leading the young during that journey. They can learn to, uh, to follow the routes from the parent, and then this migration route may be repeated up to 30 times from the first migration. But it's not, risk, it's not without risk. Those individuals that were separated from the parents before migration, they were exposed to predation by avian predators like eagles and hawks. So it's important to keep together during this time. Now, migratory animals are of course vulnerable and we are unfortunately causing some threats to some of them. Habitat destruction could be one reason they are threatened. We also uh, need to develop our societies and energy systems, for example, but we need to care for where we place those uh, wind farms, for example, in relation to migration routes to avoid collisions. We can also see that climate change is a high risk for migratory animals. And the polar bear is a, a migrant too. It can mi migrate up to 1,000 kilometers between land and sea, exploring the ice edge, uh, hunting for seals. But when they are in their right environment, and I hope we can see them also in the future, I hope we can share the uh, excitement with our future generations uh, looking at animal migration. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Suzanne.